Welcome everyone to our talk. It is going to be about testing Yocta projects. First, we would like to introduce ourselves. Florian, would you like to start and say a few words? Yeah, sure. So, test us. Just stop working. I think so. Okay, just a few words about myself. Um, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Ron Bitsticker. I work at Siemens for a couple of years now. Um, mainly uh, as a mix of a real time kernel engineer, software engineer, and stuff like that, always in the field of Linux. I haven't completely figured out what I'm doing exactly, but that's the field of that. Um, I will give the, the second uh, part of the talk uh, about on device testing, how we do that at Siemens, especially in the field of um, yeah, real time communication, so field bus um, stuff like. And yeah, with that, I would say it's time to start. Clara, it's yours. I am Clara Kowalski. I have an electrical engineering background. I work in the same department as Florian. As embedded Linux consultants, we advise other business units, other Siemens departments on how to use Linux in their Siemens products. Along such projects, it can happen that we have to modify open source or inner source projects and therefore we contribute upstream. This year I was working on a Yocto based project at Siemens and I added some Yocto testing functionalities to the project. I also had to modify along this project some Yocto functionalities, which I then contributed upstream to the Open Embedded Core project. I will talk later more about my contribution. I also contribute, for example, to Xenomai. Let's imagine you would like to build a castle. You start with just a few contributors. Everything is transparent and concise. Then, as the project evolves, it becomes more complex. The number of contributors increases and you actually come to the state where you don't know anymore who is exactly doing what. At the end, you, end, you come you, this, to the state that you have a castle which looks already quite pretty from the outside, but can you make sure that all functionalities work as intended in the inside? And that's where project testing becomes important. Along the course of your project, you should do regular testing to make sure that you don't have any unwanted functionalities. Today, unfortunately, we won't talk about testing castles, but about uh, another really interesting topic about testing Yocta projects. I will present to you two frameworks, test image and p-test. Uh, I will give a small tutorial on how to use them, but I won't go into every detail as you can have a look at the slides later on. Then I will present to you my learnings and finally the contribution I brought upstream. After that, I will hand over to Florian who will continue with Lava. For those of you who haven't been in contact with Yocto before, Yocto is an open source initiative from the Linux Foundation aiming at building Linux distributions for embedded devices and IoT devices. Now I will start with test image. Who of you has used the test image functionality before? Raise your hand. Okay, that's a few people. Test image is part of the Yocto Open Embedded project. You can find the documentation under those links. There's the wiki and the manual. As a summary, test image is a way to test the functionalities in your image. It's kind of uh, uh, system tests. When I was working on the Yocto based project at Siemens, I added the test image functionality to the project and I wrote some tests, for example, to check that the firewall rules are correct. You can run test image on QEMU, then the test image task would boot up a QEMU VM for you and run the test image tests or you can also connect to your hardware, to your device on a test via SSH and then run the tests. What you obtain is a log of the do test image task, which, which has the output shown here. So you have results, then all the tests listed, the status and the duration. The status can be passed, so your test was successful, failed or skipped, Skip means probably there were some missing dependencies, your test couldn't be run. What you also obtain when you use QMO as target is a QMO bootlog. 
and you will also receive a test results JSON, which contains the log, the same information as in the log, but in a more concise way and in JSON format. The Yocto Open Embedded projects come along with a multitude of test image tests directly ready to use. You can directly use them in your project. They are located in the meta layer on the, this path. But of course, you can also write your own test image tests, which you would then add to your layer under the same path so they can be found. Let's have a look at an example so you can write your own test image tests. Here I copied the most relevant parts of the Python test from the Open Embedded Core project. First, we have to import the OE runtime test case class as, the test, as your test is based on that class. You can then use the OE test depends to name dependencies to other tests. Here, for example, we want to make sure that the SSH test passes successfully first and only then we want to run the Python test. We can also use OE has package to name dependencies to other packages. Then follows our test definition. How can we enable test image in our image? We have to modify the image classes variable. We have to specify which tests we want to run with the test suites variable. Here, for demonstration purposes for this talk, I wrote three simple tests. I placed them in the correct path and I call, call them fail, skip and success. They don't do anything complicated. They don't check firewall rules. They just do exactly what their name says. And this is just so you can see how the log would look like. The default target is QMU, but you can also use hardware. Then you would use the simple remote target and specify the IP address of your hardware. What you then have to do is install this image on your hardware, connect via SSH and run the test image task. How can you run it? You just use this command, bitbake-c test image and then your image name. And here for my demo tests, I received this log. So we can see uh, all the tests have the expected output success, passed, and so on. Of course, the log is longer. We also get some information why a test was skipped, why it failed. Imagine you are running hundreds of tests, then the log can be quite long, and it can be a bit cumbersome to find out why a test was skipped, why it failed. But I have a solution exactly for this, and I brought my solution upstream. I will talk later more about that. But first, now I will continue with the p-test part, part. Who of you has used p-test before? Raise your hand. Okay, quite a few people. p-test is also part of the Yocto Open Embedded project. Again, you can find the documentation in the wiki and in the manual. p-test is a way to package up and run the test suite that the package or library already provides. So some packages come with a test suite to test the package functionalities, and p-test helps you to package that up. What you then obtain is a sub-package. So when you have the package foo, you receive the package foo p-test. You get the same output as for test image, and then you have two scripts that help you with running the p-test. First of all, you have the p-test-runner, which is a small C application that loops to the available tests in your image and runs them in sequence. And then you have also a small shell script called run-p-test that actually starts the test. So the minimum a p-test must contain is this p-test dash uh, one dash p test script and the actual test. Same as for test image, there are plenty of p tests you can directly use in the Yocto Open Embedded project. Here, let's have a look again at an example. Here, uh, I have the util Linux p test again from the Open Embedded Core project. 
First, you have to include the run-p-test shell script to then start a test. After that, you have to use the inherit p-test statement to enable the p-test magic in your recipe. You can use the R depends to name dependencies to packages you need to execute the p-test. You can then compile the test suite, which is basically a make test. And then you install the scripts to a specific path called p-test path. We then have to build all the p-test packages. After that, we have to decide, do we want to install all the p-test packages into our image or just specific ones? Depending on that, we use different variables. We also have to install a p-test runner, as this will loop through the available tests in our image. We can then run this. Uh, we can just start all the tests with the p-test-runner command or just a specific one. We can also SSH to our hardware and then run the p-test dash runner. We can also run p-test as part of test image. Then we have to make sure that the ping and the SSH test uh, run successfully first because our p-test depends on them. Let's come to my learnings. First of all, p-test and test image are compiled at the same time as the binaries, so ahead of runtime. No surprises at runtime. Second, they are well integrated into the bitbake procedures. We can simply call the bitbake commands and the documentation is quite good. But on the other hand, what we receive is this large log output, which can be cumbersome to read. And to visualize the test results, we need to do some post-processing. But this is the past, not anymore. I uh, went exactly through those problems when I was working uh, on the Yocto-based project. I had to um, use test image and uh, read all those logs. And then I had the task to visualize the test results in the CI-CD. And I brought my script, which I wrote for that, upstream. I will talk more about that now. So with my script, we can visualize the test results in the CI-CD pipeline. It is called junit.py. It generates a unit test report. As input, it takes the test results JSON, as this file contains all the information we need why a test was skipped, why it failed. As output, we receive a JUnit XML. Why JUnit? Because this is the format GitLab can handle, and I tested this in the GitLab CI CD. You can find my contribution upstream. How can you use it? You first have to source the open embedded build environment. And then you can use the result tool script. This is a script available since already a few years in the Yocto Open Embedded project to analyze test results. Now you can call it with the JUnit argument and you hand over the path to the test results JSON. You obtain the JUnit XML, which is now located into, in the same path as the test results JSON. I tested this with test image and p-test. Let's see how we can use this in the GitLab CI CD. Here I am using QMU as target and user space networking, so Slurp. To enable Slurp, we need to modify some variables. You can have a look later. In the in our pipeline, first we need to build our image, so basically a bit bake and then our image name. Here I'm using the tool CAS, which is a setup tool for bit bake based projects. I can really recommend to you using that. And then we just run the test image command. 
We can do the same with kernel space networking. So with tab, you can check this out here. Now, how can we call my script? Uh, just use the command I showed you, result tool, junit, and then you provide the path to the test results, JSON. GitLab just needs to know where your JUnit XML is located to then, so it knows where is the JUnit report. Then it does all the visualization for you. How does this look? So here for our three demo tests, we can see uh, we have exactly the output we expected. We have one failed test, one skipped, one passed. We can click on the test run to get some more information. We can see that one test, so we can see the duration. We can click on the view details button and for example, to find out why a test was skipped. Here, for example, there were some missing dependencies. We can also run uh, this as part, so p-test as part of test image and then we would run the ping and the SSH test first. Let's come back to my learnings. One last point, to execute the tests on our hardware, we need to manually do that. But maybe Florian has a solution for that and now I will hand over to Florian. Yeah, oh, does it work? Not sure. Yeah, works. Okay. So yeah, as uh, Clara said, with that um, I will hand over. Um, we talk about Lava. So Lava is um, basically a tool, you know, um, from Linaro. Sorry, Linaro automated validation architecture. Um, why Lava? So we have a gap in the test setup um, still. So we have to walk to our devices and uh, flash them or boot them up manually. And um, yeah, for convenient reasons, um, that's not what you want to do at um, yeah, large scale, let's say. And yeah, how well, how could we address that? And Lava was one of the options that um, uh, was available and that we um, decided to look into. Um, why Lava fits for us? Um, well, um, I said that at the beginning, so I'm most of the time working in real-time um, stuff. And um, at some point in time, and Ideally, it's um, an early point in time in the development cycle. We have to test the real hardware to make sure that there are no pitfalls um, and life, yeah, timing issues and stuff like that on the actual target hardware. So we have to test on that hardware. Um, Lava fits well. There's a lot of um, target hardware already supported. So it's basically a configuration issue to get all the different bots that we have up and running in our labs. And this is close to a perfect fit. Um, from the infrastructure side, it's quite convenient to actually uh, maintain or operate such Lava setups. Um, so especially Debian ships all the packages that we need to operate such setups so we can just install it on Debian and um, yeah, go into production, let's say. And of course, it's available in open source, which is from time to time very useful because we just can look into it and decide why we, it didn't work as we expected it. And the one or other um, configuration mistake was yeah, just a configuration mistake after we looked at the code. And um, yeah, one of the main key points I would say is that um, it's possible to integrate it convenient, in a convenient way into our um, development workflow and such a workflow might look like that. So we have um, developers um, uh, collaborating together on an in-house um, collaboration platform. We use GitLab for that. And um, you basically push your new branch or whatever feature um, to this cooperation, um, cooperation platform and from that point um, the test infrastructure can be abstracted away. So you just basically get back an email that something failed or it passed, but you haven't or you don't have to deal with all the infrastructure details behind it. So um, yeah, the following um, I have to set a little bit on focus or have to set a focus actually because Lava itself is talk on its own. Um, I'm not going to um, look too deep into the operation part of the Lava. I'm more focusing on how we submit our jobs. And um, at the end, I want to stress out the um, not so well-known feature of Lava, the so-called multi-node device tests. We can basically boot up a fleet of devices and yeah, let them communicate in an 
um, orchestrated manner and um, get back the results. So Lava itself, um, you might know it um, from um, open source projects like um, the Linux kernel functional testing or kernel CI. So this project is heavily driven or based on Lava. Um, Lava itself is a continuous integration system for deploying operation systems onto physical or even um, virtual hardware. So you could basically onboard a an QEMO device as well. Um, and a side effect, Lava is a convenient way to actually share hardware between team members or even across departments because you don't have to yeah, collect the board, do some, some testing and give the board back. And after some time, you get a back bug report, but you're not able to reproduce because you don't have the hardware anymore. And um, when the device is actually onboarded into such a Lava setup or Lava lab, as we call it, um, it's normally fully remote controllable. So you just log into a remote system and do your debugging on this hardware and you don't have to care about the logistics anymore. Um, and some references, so Lava software, as I said, the documentation is quite well. So and whenever you have um, problems, um, normally the documentation is sufficient. Um, the yeah, uh, system architecture of um, Lava looks like that. Um, so we can basically distribute it into two main components. One is the, the, the server part. It's more or less the, the user facing um, part of Lava where you have the web interface, the database, scheduler and the, the Lava daemon running. And um, the other components um, are work, um, operated on or run on the system connect to the real boards. So this is the board facing part of Lava. Um, this is nowadays called a worker. You might from time to time see the old um, namings like master and slave in the documentation, but as you know, this wording was not appropriate anymore. So we changed that. And yeah, well, on the right hand side, you can see how an, a typical setup basically looks like. So the master and the worker could run on the same machine if you like so. Um, it, it's possible that one master serves different workers and you know, boards are connected to one worker and this is where the cabling happens. We'll look into that soon. This is the cabling. So in the middle we have the worker, which is typically um, wired up with um, all the serial ports of the devices. I call that normally the, the control channel. And um, this is how Lava Con, yeah, communicates to the boards. It's typically based on zero lines. And in our labs, we have some more infrastructure. One um, really mandatory thing is basically a remote powerable power supply. So this um, power plug has more or less a web API where we can specifically power on and power off um, specific plugs. And with that, we are able to power on and power off devices. Um, as we need that later in the um, um, multi-node setup or um, test setup for our um, real-time communication setup. We have all kinds of um, Ethernet connections between the devices so that they could communicate um, to each other. And yeah, the communication to Lava is done via UART or um, yeah, control channel. There was one button. So if we want to schedule a job, this is basically what we want to do today, um, we need a couple of informations. And this information we have to write into a file, and this file will, is called the job description. And this file will later be transferred using a couple of command line tools to the Lava server. Um, necessary information is basically three things, I would say. So a job name, we can freely choose it to yeah, distinguish between our jobs. Um, a device selection, so which devices should be involved in testing, and three actions. So the deploy actions, where we tell Lava where to fetch all the artifacts that we need to boot up the device. Typical things are kernel, run disk, and rootfs. Um, boot action, you know, how, where we tell Lava how to interact with the device when it's booting up, and where to intercept the boot uh, process, possibly. And a test action, where we describe what we exactly want to have executed on the devices. Um, in our example here, so I have it because of time and constraints, keep it simple, of course. Um, we will boot up um, two at the later stage, uh, two devices. We should start with a single one. And we are network boot. So this is a quite simple configuration in Lava. You could extend it freely to cover tests like, I um, don't know, secret boot or something like that. But it's a little bit more complex. So it's possible, but not part of this talk. 
um, we will, um, in our example, uh, deploy the, the kernel and the init RTE to a TFTP server, and the rootfs will be served via NFS later, so we don't do the actual flashing on the device for now, but as to keep it simple, we will boot up the, the image using a network boot setup. So this is an example of such a job description. Job name, device type, x86 machine in this um, case, and the deploy action. So three different artifacts. We have a kernel, we have a run disk, and we have the uh, rootfs. Um, there's one feature I want to stress out here because this is a typical yeah, lava pitfall. Um, the job description might be public visible or public in terms of company internal, depends where your setup is located. And with that, there's really everything visible, which is a nice feature on the one hand side because you just can download it and redeploy or resubmit it and you will run the same tests. But be careful in case you have authentication for fetching your artifacts, it might happen that there are credentials inside and you expose them. Um, there's a feature called remote artifacts auth token um, in Lava where basically you can write down a key or an identifier and this identifier will later be yeah, supplemented by the infrastructure with the configured credentials so that the job description keeps key clean. Second stage is the boot phase. Um, as said, it will be quite simple in our case. We just tell um, Lava here that we want to do a network boot, that the um, rootfs will be served via NFS, and we supply some login credentials so that Lava is able to log into the system once it's booted up. And the final action, the test definition. And in this case, I want to um, meet the preparations that La uh, Clara um, already um, presented. So this is exactly where we can define that we want to run our p-test or pytest within Lava on the device. And there are a lot of different, um, let's say, possibilities where you can fetch your test suites from. There's a concept called Lava test suites, where you can basically reference a JIT repository and download your test suite from somewhere else. Um, in this case, we just want to call PyTest. Yeah, and with that, we have closed the circle to um, the first part of this talk. But we have not submitted a job yet. So let's do that. Um, two steps are necessary for that. One is authentication. You have to authenticate against the Lava server so that you're able, not everybody should be able to submit jobs actually. Um, there's a command line tool called Lava CLI which can do that for you. And the second step is already job submission. So just call Lava CLI job submit and the path to your job, job description file. And what you will get back and standard out in this case is the job ID and um, that Lava uses internally for um, tracking this job and we can use this job ID later um, for fetching the results. Um, but before we continue fetching results already, let's check what's happening behind the scene. So Lava will take over um, the device. So it will first of all power it on, um, device starts to boot, Lava will interact with the bootloader, um, will fetch um, the artifacts or deploy the artifacts first to the, to the Lava server and then tell the device where to actually fetch this um, from and it will log in. And at this time, you basically at this stage where you could execute any shell command and Lava would just do it. And this is actually yeah, what the test phase does, it executes the tests. Might be shell commands, might be a complex lava test to it, whatever. And once we're done, um, and done means it could be a successful test suite executed, it might be a hang, so lava has a couple of timeouts, and at some point it, lava will just decide and power off your device if there was no progress. And that's the time where we could yeah, basically fetch um, the test results. Um, is, once again, just commands um, covered by Lava CLI. Um, you can fetch the, the job logs, the job results. Um, there's also, as we had previously in Clara's part, a um, uh, JUnit report that you can download that helps normally to just visualize the um, results. And as you know, GitLab, for example, is able to parse that and 
give you a nice overview of what parts or what jobs were executed and the state or the result of those. And this is exactly what we did. So um, we fetched these results um, from our GitLab instance, part of GitLab CI, and present that back to all of our developers. And with that, uh, last part of this talk, so this was one device that we booted up in this example, but um, as I said, um, I want to boot up multiple of them. Um, you, in this case, um, we have, will have a, a controller and a device. Um, this is just a terminology coming from real-time communication. Um, you may consider that as server client, for example, so one device serving the server and um, the other ones um, trying to connect to this server application. And um, one thing you have to cover is actually that you make sure that your server is up and running before the clients start to connect. And there's also infrastructure available that we can use, as we will see. So let's extend the um, job description that I just showed um, with a, a so-called protocols block. And this is, um, we have to extend the device selection a bit. So in this case, we want to have one controller and one device, based in this case, um, once again, based on x86. Um, these are self-defined roles. You can name it whatever you want, server, client, doesn't matter. And in the test section, we can now reference to those um, roles that the devices will take. Um, and this, um, this is the, the controller, as you can see on the, the role statement here. So, and now we can define a, a list of commands that the controller should do. And in this case, um, the first thing that it actually does is to send the controller ready um, signal. So all of our devices, this is uh, the device section of the test definition, can wait for this signal. And this way we have achieved that we have some synchronization between. So the controller is up and running and we can continue with all the tests that we want to run. Yalava. Learnings. Um, so from the operational part, I would say it takes some time to set it up. That's for sure. But if it's up and running, it scales very well. So I would say from the second or th at least from the third device, it really scales well. <coughs> um, with that comes a couple of um, yeah, configuration efforts. But once again, it scales at the end. Um, I mentioned that already. It's a great way of sharing boards. So I don't have to carry and fetch all the hardware up front, do my tests and return it back. I just have or can access these boards manually. So what we normally do is if more manual access to a board is um, required, we put it into maintenance mode. Developer can do whatever he has to do on this device. And once it's finished, we put it back to operational mode. And then it's part of the test fleet again. Um, yeah, it's quite easy to maintain, actually, such a setup. So um, as I said, Debian, in our case, ships all the packages that we need. It's part of the typical update cycles and with that we're fine. Yeah, and with that, um, we're basically at the end of our journey to testing. And I think we're happy to take any questions, if there are any. Oh, there are a lot of, uh, I think. I'm not sure if you have a mic for the audience, actually. No, I don't think so. Let's start here. Um, so does p-test require Python on target? Python? Yeah. Um, Python required on the device under test? I don't think so. I don't think so. Oh, okay. okay. So no, because it's written in C. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, this is actually, um, yeah, okay, yeah, sure. So the question was how we make sure that um, only one test is running at, um, at the device at the same time so that we don't conflict um, test jobs. Um, this is actually part of the scheduler of Lava. So it basically waits, um, so it tracks all or has knowledge of all the tests that are currently running and it simply waits until the device is free again and then the next one will be scheduled. So it might happen that the developer has to wait a couple of minutes until the previous test is finished. Uh, 
Well, the, sorry, I didn't get the, the... For example, the software update process of the device under test was using TFTP, right? Right, yeah. Yeah, so is this a harder requirement no. for Lava, or you have other op uh, options to do You have a couple of other options as well. Just, this is just a simple one, but there are others. Okay, okay. yeah. Uh, yeah, um, so uh, do you feel that uh, Yocto Core is missing something uh, regarding Lava integration? Did you have to write custom code, or is this some out of the box Lava experience you have to provide? Um, so the question was, so you have to repeat. Um, if there is, or my feeling is that um, something in mis is missing in the Yocto core that it's not, um, let's say, Lava ready. Is that mm -hmm. correct? Rephrase that. Yeah. Um, no, I don't think so. Um, there was a last uh, a nice talk um, last year from an Intel guy actually who. Um, had a nice overview of what he had to do to get these test frameworks um, in a state that it cooperates with Lava. So what Lava basically does is reading standard out and then looking for several patterns. Um, but this is already done, I would say. Um, so in the Yocto core, I would say there's nothing missing from my perspective. Yeah, I guess another way to frame it is, did you have to write lots of custom shell scripts to make things work? Was this do? We didn't test this actually. Um, we only did. Uh, we stayed with the Yocto part um, on the manual side, and then uh, did Lava just uh, used it for Debian testing. Yeah, let me go back to this one here. Um, so I think this already explains this. So this was all I had on to do on Lava side to get it running. So I just called the test framework underneath. So um, PyTest Python. Uh, you just um, that's it. As long as it's Depends on the output, but no custom set, set scripting. Okay. Mic is gone. No. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, what does the actuator integration look like in Lava? So, for example, there's a lightly switch or, I don't know, something that controls external things for your testing. Do you have to manually implement this, or is there some sort of driver feature where some of the components are implemented? Um, so in, in our case, or for most cases, I don't think that you have to touch the Lava source code. You have to repeat the question. Ah, oh, sorry. Uh, repeat the question, yeah. Um, so the question was, um, if we had to modify Lava for several or for specific device features, um, like... No, no, if you were to test your device, and let's say your device is connected to a power source, and part of your testing would be cutting the power in the middle of the test, uh, how does it look like in So, um, not easy to answer this question actually because there's a lot of lava infrastructure involved. Um, if you like, we could discuss afterwards because we're running out of time, if I'm correct right now. Um, but um, for now, we um, so it's possible to extend that to some degree. Um, but for example, a lava has the strong assumption that you don't power off the device within. So you can boot the device, that's correct. So power cycle it, not really power cycle it, but reboot it. Um, this is possible, but um, the re assumption is still that you power on, run test, power off. Okay. Any more questions? No, doesn't look like. Then thank you for listening. <laughs>